Yellow snapshot, so I'm sure you've heard that quote that the best way to predict the future is to build it. Because the only way the future is pulled forth into the present is through the blood, sweat, tears, failure, and struggles of someone like an entrepreneur. Wouldn't it be amazing if everyone on the planet was deeply involved on a daily basis in building the future? If everyone was an entrepreneur, if everyone was a maker, if everyone was a creator, if everyone was innovating and disrupting the status quo. Sadly, I think our society is instructed to facilitate this. It, it's still very difficult to be an entrepreneur, to make a living, to um, get a product, get a service out into the market and be successful. Entrepreneurs make up a fraction of a fraction of the population and I think something like 90% of all startups fail. Um, so it's a tough road, but wouldn't it be awesome if we could actually have everyone do this? So I think the common barriers for why everyone isn't an entrepreneur yet is basically they don't have an idea, they don't have enough time, they don't have enough money, uh, they don't have the skill sets, they don't know what people want, and they have a massive fear of failure. Funny thing is you can't ever bring up any of those topics in the startup scene because the startup scene is very kind of, it's got this very weird culture. It's all these bros and they're just like, no excuses, just fucking do it. And they'll be like, not everyone can become an entrepreneur. That's bad. It's only for us like special people who are crazy enough and delusional enough and we're changing the world with our software as a service business for enterprise and widgets. I guess so the first thing I often hear from many people is like, oh, I don't have an idea for a business. I don't have an idea for how to change the world. I don't know where to start, all that sort of thing, which is bizarre. I have thousands of ideas. Go steal all my passwords. I guess the best way to come with ideas is to basically like constantly be looking. So subscribe to a whole bunch of news sources, spend a couple of hours every day reading about what's happening, what's out there, and just combining two ideas together to create a new one. And as you go through your daily, daily life, daily activities, basically always be looking for problems. Always be looking for something that's like, why are we doing it that way? Why couldn't it be this way? And just imagine the future. There you go, another idea. Um, that and think of like grand audacious goals, things that like don't necessarily have to have a, a money dollar profit business thing attached to it. I think a lot of people tend to think of business ideas where you sell something. The amount of really shitty like enterprise play startups out there that are basically just selling like a tiny little thing or like making a tiny little bit of money on selling something, so boring. Just go back through all my future videos. I think there's now 100, over 140. Um, and all of those are like big audacious goals most of the time. Um, and basically just work backwards. Feel free to steal all of them, run with it. So write all these ideas down and, and over time you'll notice, like over, over a couple of years, you'll notice that one particular idea, one particular mission, one particular frustration will really stick in your mind. And so for me, this relates back to the biggest barrier to entry for startups and why everyone's an entrepreneur is time and money. And that is because of fucking jobs. The traditional like five day a week, uh, nine to five is job. They, they never really, for most people, they never really pay you enough to have a bunch of savings. Like you can't, you, most people can't work one year and have one year of savings yet. And then they take all your time away. Like, <laughs> you can build a startup after hours, but most people fail at that because it's a struggle. You just don't have the time available. That and jobs tend to like grind people's mind in a mush. They basically, it, it's, it's all about specialization. You become a cog in that machine. Um, so your mindset is always about that particular industry or that particular company. And so like over the last 15 years that I've been trying to become like a full-time entrepreneur, <laughs> I have this tendency to like jump from idea to idea because I'm trying to look for something that just makes quick profits so I can sustain but throughout all that time, uh, this one idea of just how do we free people from the slavery that is 9 to 5, that one idea, that one mission has always been stuck in my head. And you'll find that with your own ideas. And so once you've got that hairy audacious goal like stuck in your head where you wake up every morning and you think about it, it's very similar, uh, it's very equivalent to like Elon Musk's mission of establishing a Mars colony. Because obviously it's a huge goal that like is well beyond yourself, like there's no clear path to it because no one's ever done it before. And there's no clear business model, there's no clear path to make money from it. But like what Elon Musk is doing with SpaceX, you basically just work backwards. So you, you say, that's the end goal. Okay, now what steps can we kind of do towards getting there? And what's the very first thing we can do? So Musk realized that the very first thing that they have to do is basically make uh, rockets cheaper. Uh, base the, the biggest issue is getting payloads into orbit because it's really expensive. And so step one, reusable rockets, because the major cost is actually the rocket itself, not so much the fuel. A bit like airplanes, you wouldn't throw out the entire 747 after every flight. And the cool thing about having a massive goal that's like well beyond yourself is that the fear of failure shouldn't really come in because it's likely that you will fail along the way to that goal. If Elon Musk fails in establishing a Mars colony within his lifetime, no one's going to be like, oh, you failed me, Elon, you failed at setting up a Mars colony. It's like, what? <laughs> but at least he's laid the groundwork for it to happen. I guess on a practical level, now you've got your big, hairy, audacious goal that might be like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years out in the future. And then you just work backwards, like work backwards in increment of 10 or 5 years. And what do you have to do? Then when you map it all back, you basically come up with this like, okay, what do you do? What do you do first? Because <laughs> at least, at least if you do the first thing, as much as it's going to suck and probably fail, at least you're moving towards that path. And that first step towards that end goal might be something that looks completely different and outside of the path. But so long as it's moving towards that goal, like one example might be generating more revenues to give you more time. So for me to free people from 9 to 5 jobs, I need to free myself. <laughs> I need to have a, a guaranteed kind of regular income source that gives me free time. 
So to achieve that financial kind of freedom, um, there's basically three options. You can either like work a really high paying job and somehow save enough for at least a year or two of savings, or become a freelancer and be able to have a skill set where you can charge a high enough rate so that you can work maybe just a few hours per week and that covers all your expenses for the rest of the week, which is what I'm working on now. Or finally get an investor or get accepted into some accelerator program. But that's the hardest of all of those options because investors typically only want to invest in things that they see clear ROI. You'll find more and more that a lot of these like startup accelerators and incubators when they invest in you, most of them don't invest in ideas. They invest in companies that already have customers and revenues coming in. And the smaller the startup scene, the more risk averse they are. So in the Australian startup scene, there aren't you know billionaires who have exited who are just happy to like risk money. They all want to see a return on investment, so they make conservative investments. Because we don't all have a basic income yet, uh, we obviously have to like work to survive. We have to create an income to be able to pay for food and rent and clothing and electricity. But so once you escape that hurdle of time and money, <laughs> so now you have like enough money to survive, to not die, and you have enough time to actually focus on a startup, here's what you do. Don't build anything. Don't go look for a developer yet. Don't do anything. Literally just go talk to your potential customers. People who you think might buy your product or service, go and talk to them. Really deeply understand their problems and how it relates back to your grand mission and to your plan, your kind of path towards that grand, audacious goal. And just write down all the problems that they have right now. You then follow this kind of lean methodology, lean startup methodology or agile methodology or uh, sprint methodology if you go look up all those three terms. So you've got your big audacious goal, you've got a bunch of uh, potential customer problems that they have right now. You then go away and sketch up some solutions and just sketch. You don't need a code, you don't need a developer yet, you don't need a product. Then go back to those customers that you interviewed and show them the, your sketches, show them your potential solution to their problems. Uh, and that could be a service or a product and just see what they think. Explain to them how some of those features in your product or service can actually solve their problems that they talked about and really hone in on which, which one feature everyone resonates with and has the most interest in. That one feature that you've uh, found resonates most with those potential customers, that now becomes your thing, it's called an MVP, minimum viable product. Throw away all the other features and just build a product with that one feature. So you'll probably need a developer, so you can either go and um, find a co-founder or find a mate or find someone who you get along with well who, who buys into this vision and get them to help build the product for you. But just be very careful, particularly at the be beginning, because co-founders and partnerships can be very messy. Um, so particularly for the first MVP, it might even be better just to outsource and hire a developer. If you're only doing a minimum viable product, meaning one feature and throw away everything else, no crazy buttons, no complex thing, it should cost you less than $1,000 and be developed in less than a month. Then all you do is you go back to those customers once you've got the product and you say, hey, here's the product that solves that solution that we talked about. Um, do you want to try it? And just, just let them try it for free or let them, you know, put a price on it. Then monitor all the data. So watch how they use it, um, watch what buttons they click, see how much they go to it, see how much, you know, basically all the data. And then go back to them and then just like more and more interviews with those customers. This is what, what is called uh, customer-driven product development. Because basically all you're doing is you're developing out that product based on the customer feedback. Only build stuff that customers want. Otherwise, why are you building it? From there, you add more features and you find more customers and you build more revenues and you hire people and then you, you should be slowly moving towards your end goal. Then you find more co-founders, you find evangelists, you find uh, more employees and throughout this whole process, really, really be public and tell people why you're doing this product, your big audacious goal. Like for example with SpaceX, their business model at the moment is launching commercial satellites to orbit, but throughout the entire process, Elon Musk is very obvious and clear that the entire mission and purpose of SpaceX is to create a Mars colony. And because when you have a big mission like that, not only can you generate revenues and profits that you can like reinvest into R&D to make that mission happen, but you create evangelists, you create supporters who want to see you achieve that mission. And also, if the big, hairy, audacious goal is well beyond you and your company and what like one small company can do, turn the whole thing into a platform. Be very clear that we need help from others to achieve this mission. So for example, with my, with my jobs DAO, my jobs RPG, my saving people from 9 to 5 slavery, I'm definitely going to be opening it up into a platform, a global DAO on the blockchain that everyone can plug into. So for my example, uh, to free people from 9 to 5 jobs, I need the help of the entire economy. I need the help of existing like outsourced and freelance businesses and education and companies to plug in. So the plan is to basically create like a, a blockchain-based DAO that helps connect people with uh, higher requests or employers or gig requests and people with the skills to make that happen. Problem solution. That becomes the free, open, decentralized public backend that everyone can plug into. And on the front end, I'll be working on my own UI concept for how I think people should be working in the future. But then all existing businesses, things like freelancer.com, things like Upwork, all the education institutions will want to plug into this system. Well, I hope they plug into this system in the back end. So anyway, just a few thoughts on how you can actually achieve hairy audacious missions. It takes a long time. It's a lot of struggle to get over that first initial hurdle. But I think this is the method. How do we make it better? Start your thoughts.